Thanks, Wayne. Great to see everybody tonight. Uh, really, really appreciate you being willing to uh, take your time to uh, share in this seminar. Uh, before I get started on our topic tonight, I want to just kind of thank Wayne for his kind remarks, but also say, yeah, Wayne and I have known each other, I think now, going on 12 years. And while I look at myself on Zoom and see that I'm aging, he continues to be eternally young, 29 and holding. So <laughs> you, you all have a, a really young pastor who's watching over the, the care of your church there. So God bless you, Wayne, for, for your good ministry. They keep me young. Yeah. Yes, they do. Um, let me uh, share with you where I want to go, and I'm going to put my screen up here just to, in just a minute, and I'm going to uh, walk through a whole bunch of PowerPoint slides with you as we walk through this. So let, before I do that, though, let, let me begin by saying um, what I want to do tonight is put on my historian's hat. Uh, I always call church history or history in general kind of my avocation teaching pastoral leadership and preaching is kind of, kind of my vocation. But uh, I love history. I continue to read history. I'm reading a, a great book right now on the Reformation. So that's kind of my avocation. So tonight, as we walk through this, I want you to know that I have my historian hat on. Now, um, after we get through running through the content, um, I'm going to take that hat off. And then I'm just going to try to do a little bit of Q&A with you if you have questions. And I'm of the opinion, and I want you to hear me well, there is no such thing as a dumb question. In other words, if there's something on your mind, something on your heart that you want to ask, when we get to the Q&A, I want you to throw it out there, and we're going to process it a little bit. So once again, thanks for your time. And without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. And I hope you can see that. Can everybody see that okay? <laughs> yes. The title of my lecture that I want to walk through tonight is God and the Americans. And I want to begin with a quote from my favorite historian of all time, Paul Johnson. Paul Johnson is now 91, going on 92. He's written all kinds of various books and articles over the years. He has a fondness in his heart for America as a country. Years and years ago, he wrote an article, which is still one of the best surveys of Christianity in America in commentary journals. And here's how he began, and I want to quote this. He says, no other country in history enables us to examine more closely the interaction among religious belief, culture, and public life than the United States of America. To begin with, this is the first and only instance in which we can watch a major Christian community coming into being by the light of documentary sources. America did not mysteriously emerge in prehistory. Its early evolution was not prescriptive. It was born in the clear light of recorded history, and its first Christian inhabitants were only too anxious to explain what they were doing and why. And then Johnson goes on and talks about the fact that the earliest Americans saw themselves as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, like the Israelites from the Old Testament, that they had come here to set up a new civilization. Now, I'm going to get to the Puritans here in just a moment, because that's really where our story begins. But I'm going to run through Puritanism fairly quickly, because what I really want to get to are the two parts that we see on this screen, the advent and impact of revivalism. Tonight, friends, what I want to talk to you about is revival, revival. We're going to talk a lot about revival, and then I want to talk about the origin and development of what I consider to be the one truly indigenous American church, and that is the African American church and its form of Christianity, and then we're going to tie all these together. So, as I said, let me begin by asking us to reflect on this question, because this is the reason you may have signed up for this lecture tonight. And I want us to just reflect within our own hearts and minds here for a moment. But what do you think about this? Is or was America, and by America, I mean the United States of America. Is or was the United States of America a Christian nation? And if you believe that it is, 
Here's the other question I want you to think and reflect on, especially as we walk through our content tonight. If you think that's true, how do you define Christian? So here's the question that I want to look at tonight, and I'm going to continue to raise this. And then as we come to the end, I'm going to give you my opinion with my historian's hat on. So here's our question. Is or was the United States of America a Christian nation? Well, as I said, we've got to go back and we've got to start at the beginning. And that takes us to the 17th century. Here's the background. And that was the Puritan goal in America. Most of you are very familiar one way or the other with the English Puritans transposing themselves across the Atlantic because they were facing persecution in England and they came to the shores of what was the new world, primarily in what today we call the area around Massachusetts. And there they established the Massachusetts Bay Colony. The Puritan goal in America, friends, was this. They wanted to establish a Christian civilization, a Christian civilization of the truly converted. Mm -hmm. See, because what they thought they were leaving was a decrepit, corrupt, immoral civilization where most people were not Christians, even though England had been Christian, either Catholic or, or in terms of Anglican, mm -hmm. for over 1,200 years. They thought that it was corrupt. So they wanted to leave the corruption. That's why they got on all those small boats and they crossed the Atlantic at great risk to themselves. They brought their wives and their children and they came here because they wanted to establish a Christian civilization of everybody who was truly converted. This is what historians call the holy experiment of Puritanism, creating a genuine Christian civilization where everybody was born again, truly regenerate. Well, how did that go? Well, they failed. <laughs> they failed. There's a number of reasons they failed, but let me just walk through a couple. First of all, one of the things about Puritan New England that stands out is that Puritanism always, just because of the way it operated as a form of Christianity, it always caused dissent. So what the Puritans would do is they, they'd create dissenters, and then those dissenters would get kicked out of Massachusetts Bay. One of the most famous Puritan dissenters was Roger Williams. He was going to be arrested, and the leader of Massachusetts Bay, John Winthrop was his friend, came to him in the middle of the night and said, Roger, you need to pack up and leave our colony because tomorrow morning the authorities are coming to arrest you for being a dissenter. So what Williams did was he packed up and left and he journeyed south to a new place where he banded together with some Native Americans and he called that place Providence. God had providentially led him there and that eventually became another colony and now today Providence is the capital of the state of Rhode Island. But here's the point. Dissenters were always kicked out or they left New England. Now, here's another thing that's unique about the American experience. This becomes very important as we're going to walk through our time together tonight. In America, there was always a place to go. In Europe, that wasn't true. I mean, you were jammed together in cities or towns or even in the countryside. There was just nowhere to go. But in America, as long as you could get along with the natives, you could cross the next mountain, you could cross the next river, you could go to that new area where there was no one else, you could always leave. And because you could leave, you could start something new. And that is part and parcel of the American psyche from the time of the Puritans in the early 17th century, clear up to today, you could always leave. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about in terms of the Puritan experiment was it failed simply because you can't create a civilization where everybody's going to be truly born again. That's just not reality. And so by the end of the 17th century, around the year 1690, the last of the great Puritans was a guy by the name of Cotton Mather. And he wrote a huge book called The Great Works of Christ in America. And what he did was he, he basically wrote this history of Puritan New England, and he concluded this. He said this. He said, the mother begat the daughter 
and the daughter devoured the mother. And what then he, he translated that into contemporary terms. He said, Puritanism, our Christianity created wealth, and we got wealthy, and then our wealth ate up our Christian commitment. Hmm. And he said, I'm very, very afraid that we are in danger of losing the call of God to spread the gospel into this new wilderness. So Cotton Mather was lamenting. have any impact on the development of American civilization and the overall development of the, the Christian faith beyond the Puritan experiment of the 17th century. Wayne, can you hear me okay? I can, you cut out for a second there, but I can't uh, hear you now. Okay, well, it keeps telling me my internet connection is weak and I've never gotten that message before, so I hope that's not the devil, all right? Amen. <laughs> All right. Well, let me let me move on ahead here. Let me talk about revivalism, and I want to begin with what we call in the early 18th century the First Great Awakening. There was tremendous dullness in the first part, last part of the, the 17th century, beginning in the beginning of the 18th century. Tremendous spiritual dullness, but a lot of Christians gathered together for prayer, and they were praying for revival. Now, let me give you this definition of revival. And I've kind of cobbled this together from different historians of revival and thrown a little bit of Scott Winnegan in here too. But here's how I'm defining revival. It's the divine work of the Holy Spirit whereby unbelievers are converted. The lost come to faith in Christ and believers, good Presbyterians like you, and I'm a Presbyterian at heart, friends, Good Presbyterian believers like you and me are renewed and empowered for greater works of faith and love. So that's what we're talking about here in terms of revival. Revival comes and people who are not saved get saved. And the saved become energized to go out and do all kinds of ministry. Well, between 1720 and 1740, there were a series of smaller revivals. But in 1735, in Northampton, Massachusetts, where Jonathan Edwards, the great colonial pastor, was pastoring, this is where the Great Awakening, true revival, started. Edwards, for years, had been kind of pounding away at his flock, and he described them basically as dead bones, dry souls. But then in 1735, what happened was there was this dramatic outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon Edwards through his preaching, and hundreds of people in his parish and in the area around Northampton got converted, and those who were already converted got revived to do works of ministry. There were just tremendous numbers who were converted. Now, many of you here, when you were in junior high or senior high or maybe in college, you took a class in American literature. And if you took a class in American literature, chances are your teacher, your professor, along the way, had you read one of the most famous pieces of American literature, Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, when Edwards preached that, and you have to understand, Edwards wasn't known for being this enormously enthusiastic, scintillating communicator. He, he had his spectacles down on his nose, and he read through his manuscript. But as he was reading through his manuscript, people started to stand up and grab the walls of the church. Others grabbed the pillars of the church. Others were holding on the pew and they were crying out, stop, 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 stop. But he kept on going and revival happened. Now, what you're never told in American lit classes is this. The week after Edwards preached sinners in the hands of an angry God, he preached another sermon sinners in the hands of a loving God. And he did the exact same thing. He had his spectacles on his nose. He read through his manuscript word for word. And as he was doing that, people were grabbing onto the walls of the church and the pillars of the church and the pews of the church saying, stop, 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 because revival had come. Revival. They got revived. <clears throat> now, here's what happened throughout the colonies. In 1739, 
the great British evangelist, George Whitfield, who has to go down as one of the two or three greatest preachers in the history of Christianity. Whitfield travels across the Atlantic from England and comes to America. And he traverses the 13 colonies, preaching everywhere he goes. And he's an evangelist. He's a revivalist. Historians think that in 1739, 1740, there were somewhere between three to three and a half million Americans, and that included African-American slaves. In other words, that was everybody from the oldest to the youngest. And they think that Whitfield preached to somewhere between 95 and 97% of those three and a half million people. In other words, Whitfield becomes the first American celebrity. Everybody in colonial America, all the way from north of Massachusetts Bay down to Georgia Colony, everybody knew who Whitfield was. He was this hugely gifted communicator, and everybody had heard him preach at one time or another. Just to uh, make the point about what a great communicator he was, Benjamin Franklin and Whitfield were friends. And I'm not convinced that Franklin ever received the gospel, although Whitfield continued for years to try to convert him. But in Franklin's autobiography, he shares an episode when he went to hear Whitfield preach. And I want to share this with you. He said, I happened to attend one of his, that is Whitfield's sermons, in the course of which I perceived that he intended to finish with a collection, meaning an offering. And I slightly resolved he should get nothing from me. Well, the collection was for Whitfield's Georgia Orphanage, which Franklin thought had, was ill-planned, and he had told Whitfield so to no avail. Thus, for some time, he had refused to give to it. At the sermon, though, Franklin said this, and these are Franklin's own words from his autobiography. He said, I had in my pocket a handful of copper money, three or four silver dollars, and five pistoles in gold. As he proceeded, I began to soften and concluded to give the coppers. Another stroke of Whitfield's oratory made me ashamed of that and determined to give me, determined me to give the silver. And he finished so admirably that I emptied in my, my pocket, wholly into the collector's dish, gold and all. Well, that's how great of a communicator Whitfield was. And so he stimulates and God uses him to encourage and promote and spread revival throughout the colonies. And this becomes known as the first great awakening. Now, here were some of the consequences of the awakening. There were a rise of numerous itinerant evangelists traveling throughout uh, the colonies in Whitfield's wake and going even further to the frontier. There were tons of prayer meetings. This created enormous controversy between people who wanted church done the old way versus all these new people who were coming into the church and they wanted to change things. Does that sound familiar at all? And they had churches split, but thousands and thousands and thousands of colonial Americans, white and black, and I'll come back to that later, were saved. In addition, there was significant growth in church attendance. New educational facilities were started, Dartmouth and Princeton, and those those colleges, which are, you know, now part of the Ivy League, those were started, just like Harvard and Yale, to train clergy, smart Presbyterians like Wayne Darbon. <laughs> now, here, here's the other impact of the Great Awakening. Many historians are now willing to admit that the Great Awakening created a sense of emotionalism that eventually would spill over into the drive for independence. In other words, there was some political out of the Great Awakening. But once again, this takes us back to our question here, friends. What about the America with the first Great Awakening? Was or is America a and then the early 19th century in terms of America, obviously, you know this, I'm giving us the I view. I'm just, let me talk about the impact of deism on the formation of the United States. Deism is the theological belief that God does exist, but that he is very impersonal, and he's there on the other side of the universe dealing with other things. God kind of set creation into motion, set the universe into motion, 
use the laws of nature to create to let uh, the universe <laughs> function, and then he's kind of off doing some other things. He's he's busy playing golf with Gabriel or something else. He's not involved personally with us. Now, here's what I want you to note, and this is very very important for our topic. The writer of the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson, the framers of the American Constitution, like Masson and John Adams, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, all of them were deists. Alexander Hamilton was probably a born again Christian, but almost all of the other founding fathers, and I wanna stress this, they were geniuses. They were geniuses. They created this incredibly great country and they created it from scratch but they were deists. They were not evangelical Christians. They could not sign the doctrinal statement of St. James Presbyterian Church. Hamilton might have been able to do that. Nobody else could have. Now that's important. Keep that in mind. So with the American Revolution and then the Constitu Constitutional Convention, what you had was a split down the lines between Christians. With the Revolution, you had some Christians who wanted to remain loyal to England. Others said, no, we're going to be patriots and we're going to create this new country. But when the country was formally established, the Congress came back to Madison and they said, we've got a great constitution, but we want you to write for us a bill of rights. And so Madison, who was an incredible governmental genius, sat down and wrote out the bill of rights. And here's the first amendment, freedom of religion. What Madison meant by that was he said, there's gonna be no established church. And what he meant by that and what the rest of the framers meant by that was you were not going to have a state-supported church, either Catholic or Protestant, as they had done in Europe for centuries. That didn't mean, and I want you to note this, that didn't mean they didn't want Christianity in the public square. They did. They wanted, they wanted to have a Christian populace because they thought, we've created this democratic republic, and only a moral populace will be able to keep this thing going but they did not want an established church. They did want religion in the public square though, and we need to keep that in mind as well. So when people talk about, well, the framers of the United States were these deists and they were secular. No, they weren't. They were deists, but they wanted Christianity in the public square. Now, let me talk about the development of the American frontier at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. In terms of American history, the frontier is one of the most significant things that's ever happened in America. Once again, it's the idea as Americans grew numerically, they poured west over the Appalachian Mountains and they went into the Ohio River Valley and the Mississippi River Valley. And then eventually, you know, they eventually went to the Great Plains and they eventually went clear to the west. Well, as Christians saw this development of this new country going west, in the late 18th, early 19th century, here's what they wanted to do. They wanted to shape the destiny of this new nation. In 1776, we think, we think from what we can tell from records, about 10% of Americans were church members. But I want you to note this, from 1792 to 1821, nine new states were added in a relatively short period of time. And by 1850, half of the American population lived west of the Appalachians. In other words, Christians in the late 18th, early 19th century in North America, they saw the frontier as a huge, huge, huge mission field. And so here's how they tried to impact American society. Two great ways. First of all, through what they called the voluntary society. These were Christian groups that gathered together for a common cause. In other words, today we would call groups like this parachurch ministries, but you had voluntary societies of temperance, Sabbatarianism, abolition, Bible societies, Sunday school unions, all kinds of voluntary societies where Christians would gather together, they would see a need, they would pull their resources, and then they'd use their resources to meet that need. And then, in addition to the voluntary society, you had the, the development of what became known as the Second Great Awakening. In, 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 the, East, in the East, the Second Great Awakening was led by Timothy Dwight, who was the president of Yale. 
and he was the grandson of Jonathan Edwards. And in the West, on the frontier, it was led by this guy named James McCready. And one of the things that's important to keep in mind is the frontier had terrible conditions. There was a lot of violence, a lot of crime. There was isolation. The occult was pretty prominent. <clears throat> but uh, at Cane Ridge in Kentucky, in the late 18th, early 19th century, there was this huge revival that took place. And there were like 20,000 people that were saved there, 10 days of preaching. And out of the Cane Ridge revival came the idea of what eventually became Baptist and Methodist circuit riders. Because the Baptists and the Methodists at that time were not very established and they were trying to win people to Christ. So they'd send these men riding the circuit from town to town, location to location. And they would preach, they would establish small groups. Eventually, if they could, they would start churches and then they would ride their circuit again. In other words, what both Baptists and Methodists were doing was they were expanding Christianity in and through the frontier. Let me give you a quote from a Frenchman by the name of Alexis de Tocqueville. And de Tocqueville came to visit the United States in the early part of the 19th century. And then he went back to France and he wrote this famous book called Democracy in America. And if you ever go to uh, grad school in sociology, this is one of the required texts. You've got to read de Tocqueville because he was kind of a, a sociologist. And here's what he said about what he found when he visited America. He said, in France, I had almost always seen the spirit of religion, and he meant Christianity, and the spirit of freedom pursuing courses diametrically opposed to each other. But in America, I found that they were intimately connected and that they reigned in common over the same country. And then I want you to listen to this. This is a really important quote from de Tocqueville. Remember, he's making this comment in 1835, and he's outside the system, so to speak. He says, religion, in other words, Christianity, must be regarded as the foremost of the political institutions of the United States. For if it does not impart a taste for freedom, it facilitates the use of free institutions. And then Americans, he concluded, held religion, quote, to be indispensable to the maintenance of Republican institutions. In other words, as de Tocqueville traveled around America in 1835, he concluded, America's really pretty Christian, pretty much all the way around. And so what happened after that was you have this development sociologically and morally, what we might call a moral theology of the melting pot. Hmm. In other words, by the time of de Tocqueville, I think we could conclude America was extremely religious in a general Christian sense. And American society was in now imbibed with a general Protestant ethic. Well, after the Civil War, meaning post-1865, that idea of a moral theology and a Protestant ethic began to be inculcated in American society through the public school system. And so this moral theology inculcated and enculturated waves and waves and waves of immigrants who came to the United States from 1870 clear up to 1930. Chinese immigrants, Japanese immigrants, Italian immigrants, um, Irish immigrants, uh, Southern and Eastern European immigrants. Anybody who came here had to eventually send their kids to the public school. And they were kind of imbibed in this general moral theology of the melting pot. And it was a Protestant ethic, so to speak. Now, let me quickly, and I'm going to run through this material relatively quickly because I want to, you know, kind of get to our conclusion here and then we can have some time for Q&A. I want to talk about slavery. I want to talk about Christianity and I want to talk about the American Civil War because you can't talk about Christianity in America without talking about this issue. Here was the background. African-American slaves were introduced into America at Jamestown in 1619. That's before the, the Puritans came in 1620. So slavery 
was part of American culture beginning in 1619. Mm -hmm. By what's that? About 160 years later, 1776, there were 500,000 African American slaves in the colonies. Obviously, mm -hmm. most of them from Virginia South. By 1830, there were 2 million slaves in the U.S. Now, the slave trade was ended where you could import slaves in the early part of the 19th century. But what you have going on here is westward expansion and the slave population is growing. In other words, you've got slaves with families who are reproducing. Now, here's the interesting thing. Most historians think that revivalism probably would have eradicated slavery in America except for the advent, the invention of the cotton gin by Eli Whitney. And here's what happened. Cotton was very, very expensive to grow. You needed huge tracts of land and enormous amounts of labor. You needed lots and lots of slaves. So not very many people could plant cotton and own slaves. But once Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin, the cotton gin made the the harvesting and then the production of, of cotton into garments, much, much, much easier, much, much less expensive. So now what happened was you could create your own mini plantation with four or five slaves as long as you had a cotton gin. If you got 30 or 40 acres and you had four or five, 10 slaves, then you could increase your socioeconomic status very quickly, very fast. And so what happened was, as um, white Americans began to move west and south into places like Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, eventually into Texas, they were taking slaves with them. And so slavery was spreading west as the Americans went west. And this became a huge political issue in the 19th century. Now, here's how Christianity came to the slaves. Slavery obliterated African culture. If you ever saw Alex Haley's uh, show from 1976-77 Roots, talked about Kunta Kinte, the slave who came from Africa, and they, they forced him to give up his African ways. They beat him until he, he renounced that. So slavery obliterated African culture. Slaves were Christianized mostly by evangelists through the Great Awakenings. Remember I said that everybody heard Whitfield preach? Slaves heard Whitfield preach. Remember the Second Great Awakening and the spread of Christianity to the frontier? Slaves heard the gospel preached. A few of them were taught to read the Bible, and then over time, over time, black Christian slaves developed their own indigenous church. In other words, in my opinion, this is the one truly indigenous church in North America. It started here amongst these people, and eventually, some historians have called it the invisible institution. It was there, it was an institution, it was doing ministry, but it was really, really, really under the radar because they were slaves. Now, in slave culture, the preacher was the most important figure. He was called by God. He was charismatic in his delivery. And the preacher oftentimes would focus on one of two themes. He would focus on Exodus, meaning the book of Exodus, where you remember the Israelites were set free from slavery from Egypt, and they were going to the promised land. And the preacher would focus on heaven. Because if you live in slavery and you're oppressed, you're thinking my only way out might be to go to be with Jesus in heaven. Now, let me talk about the anti-slavery movement. Actually, um, it was uh, strongest in the South in the early part of the 19th century due to the spread of revival and the, the visual impact of slavery on everybody. I mean, everybody recognized this was an incredibly oppressive institution. And I think a lot of people thought that it would eventually there would be a gradual voluntary end to it. And there were not very many defenses of slavery before 1820. But here's what happened. <laughs> Following the, about 1820, there was a new revivalist movement led by Charles Finney. 
and it started in the north and Finney tied his revivalism to the idea of the abolition of slavery. And Finney said this, you cannot be a Christian unless you are opposed to slavery, that those two are completely, you know, incongruent with each other. And so what happened was you had this huge reaction to Finney's revivalism in the South and they dug in their heels. And then eventually you had numerous anti-slave publications, the Bible against slavery. And then one of the most famous books in all of American history, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet mm -hmm. Beecher Stowe, where she wrote this historical novel about how oppressive slavery was. It sold hundreds of thousands of copies and it hardened people in the South against her in the North and it hardened people in the North against Southern <laughs> slave owners. Across the board, Christians took one of three positions. Those who were pro-slavery said, hey, the Bible doesn't consent to condemn slavery. In fact, you can go to the Old Testament, you can go to the New Testament, it's all over the place. So if the Bible doesn't condemn it, how can we? And then there were the abolitionists, the anti-slavery groups, slavery is offensive to God. And then there were the, you might say the middle group, hey, let's just evangelize, let's not talk about slavery because that's too divisive. We don't wanna go there. Now, here's one of the things we need to keep in mind, and this has always <laughs> intrigued me as a preacher and a pastor. Everybody was using the same Bible to justify their positions. Everybody. Everybody said, hey, I'm a Christian, I'm using the same Bible. You're just reading it wrong. And so what happened was the debate over slavery grew and eventually split churches, families, denominations. And then finally, as we'll see here in a minute, it split the nation. In 1845, the Southern Baptist Convention was formed because of slavery. All the Baptists south of what became known as the Mason-Dixon line withdrew from the Baptist General Convention and formed the Southern Baptist Convention. And it was over slavery. Friends, you're Presbyterians. I can't let you off the hook here. Right. Presbyterians split three times over slavery, 1837, 1857, and right after the Civil War started in 1861. <laughs> now, let me talk briefly about Christianity and the Civil War here. Christianity, in many, many, many ways, historically, led to the Civil War because Christianity is a religion of morality, right and wrong, good and evil, righteousness and justice. And so eventually, there's no way you're going to get around this issue nationally, politically, religiously, spiritually, especially morally. So you can argue that the American Civil War was a Christian civil war between competing views over the issue of slavery. And if you know anything about Civil War history in terms of the military and military tactics, it was in many ways the first modern war. They were used in 18th century tactics, but now they had all these new weapons. And so it was unbelievably destructive of human and animal life. Somewhere between 600 and 700,000 Americans died in the American Civil War and millions more were maimed. <laughs> Having said that, there were revivals in both the Confederate armies and the Union armies throughout the Civil War. Thousands were converted. Abraham Lincoln became president in 1861 and immediately the South began to secede and set up the Confederacy. Lincoln's major goal early on was simply to preserve the Union. But as time went on, Lincoln began to change and his positions began to change and finally, he became what we might call the moral arbiter for the whole country with a theological perspective and a Christian conscience. Now, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., and you journey to the west end of the mall, you come to the Lincoln Memorial. And as you walk mm -hmm. up the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, there's Lincoln seated like Solomon on his throne. And as you walk yes. on the inside of the Lincoln Memorial, up to the left, you'll see to your left uh, inscribed on the wall, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which most everybody's read or you had it read to you when you were in school. But as you look up to the right, there is inscribed on that wall, Lincoln's second inaugural address. And in my opinion, it should be read and rehearsed on a regular basis. 
This is what Lincoln shared at his second inaugural. And this is before the Civil War was over. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read the last two paragraphs. Because in his second inaugural address, Lincoln is reflecting, he's meditating. Yeah, I think he's theologizing about the Civil War and what God was doing with America through the Civil War. So listen to what he says here. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with or even before the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of another man's face. But let us judge not that we not be judged. The prayers of both could not be answered, that of neither has been fully answered. The Almighty has his own purposes. Quote, woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by who the offense cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which in the providence of God must needs come, but which having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war, as the woe due to those by whom that offense came, Shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice towards none, with charity towards all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we're in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, and to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Now, before I tie the bow on this, I'm going to give you my opinion. Lincoln is theologically reflecting what caused this war. And he's concluded, I think, pretty clearly. God caused the Civil War to make Americans pay the price for African-American slavery. That was the mm. cause. That's why the war came, and the war is going to continue until that price has been paid. And Lincoln said, mm. that's what a just God would do, wouldn't he? I mean, isn't that what all believers say, that God is just? So this leads us to our question, and I'm going to give you my answer, and then we can do some Q&A if we have any time left over. Sure. Is... Or was America, meaning the United States of America, a Christian nation? Well, if you mean that politically, the answer is no. The United States is a nation state that was formed from 1776 with the Declaration of Independence up through the Constitutional Convention of 1789. And it was a nation state formed and framed by this group of geniuses, almost all of whom were deists, almost none of whom were born again Christians. They were creating a new country and a new government that was split into three branches so that you would have a balance of powers between these three branches so that no one branch would ever dominate the other two. And so that you would have this democratic republic. So if you mean politically, no, the United States is a invention of the modern world. It's a nation state. But if you mean, was America, at least for much of its history, Christian culturally, meaning did Christianity dominate the culture? Yes. I mean, De Tocqueville said that in 1835, and you could see that clear up into the 20th century. And I would argue that even today in 2020, Christianity is still very, very, very prominent throughout the United States of America, all the way from Maine 
to California, all the way from Florida up to, to Alaska. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of Christian churches throughout America, and there are millions of Christians. So culturally speaking, even though our society's changed and continues to change and there's lots going on, and you're seeing this and I'm seeing this, but in the past, and I would say certainly up through the 1950s, culturally speaking, culturally, socially, yeah, America was a Christian nation culturally. Does that mean everybody was a Christian? No. But does it mean that there was a general Christian ethos? Yeah. I mean, the family I grew up in exemplified this. We didn't go to church, but my parents would have called themselves Christians, and they took us to church on, you know, Christmas and Easter. We were kind of part of the Holly and Lily crowd. But we were raised with a general Christian worldview. God exists, and you should follow the Ten Commandments. Now, I, w I didn't become a Christian until I was 19 in college, because I didn't know the Lord until then. But I was raised in a Christian environment. Now, that's changing now today, and I don't want to deny that. But I would say, was America a Christian nation? Well, not politically, no. But culturally, you betcha. Okay, I'm going to stop there and zip it up, Wayne. I'll turn it over to you. Well, let me just, let's uh, just open it up to um, questions that people have or comments um, that you might, that people have in response to what uh, Scott has shared. Any questions or comments that come out? I think one of the things that I hear a lot, um, and maybe every generation has felt this way, it seems more now, Scott, than it uh, maybe did before, because I grew up in a similar kind of environment where I wasn't in a Christian home, but there were, there was a respect for the Ten Commandments and and so on. Yeah. Um, and the morality that comes that's influenced culturally by uh, the Bible, certainly, um, is it? It feels like that's, uh, you know, just uh, being lost. That there are shifts taking place. And, and maybe those, there are false assumptions about that, or maybe that just feels uh, more and more true. Maybe those in positions of influence uh, are demonstrating or, or speaking about that less. There might be a lot of different forces, uh, but uh, would you say that that's a shift that's taking place or just a new uh, formation that's a challenge for, the, for churches and the church as a whole in the mission field? I mean. Well, in my opinion, from the things that I've been able to read and discern, there's a clear-cut move in terms of the large number of people who now claim on religious surveys that they have no religious affiliation. And the sociological term we use to designate them, and you know this, Wayne, are the nuns. And one of my favorite writers, James Emery White, who's a pastor in North Carolina, has a book out, it's about two years old now, called The Rise of the Nuns. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about the fact that there's this huge shift now where a large number of people, primarily under the age of 40, are saying we have no religious affiliation. And he says, there's this huge mission field, this huge target group that churches need to go after, and it's the nuns. And then right on their heels is the newest younger generation, what they call Generation Z, and yeah, they're they're different. So, because yeah, I see some I see some of them in class. <laughs> sure, <laughs> you know, because the assumption of what it means to be the church or the mission of the church shifts. When you you know you mentioned up to the 1950s, the assumption was somebody was a Christian. Like you said, they may not go to church except for Christmas and Easter, but there was this sense of I'm not something else. And so there's, I'm, I'm informed by my culture that's informed by the gospel or by, by the Bible. And so the assumption wasn't if you went to church, it was where you went to church. Uh, right. or, or, and, so, and that has shifted in these last, say, 50, 60, 70 years significantly, certainly in the last 20, 30 years, to where the assumption is not that you're connected with a church 
family or uh, that you're, or even Christian, the, that the assumption that you would identify yourself, it's more and more likely you would say none than, oh no, I'm primarily influenced. Even if I'm not a Christian, I'm not even sure I want to admit or confess I'm influenced by Christianity in my morality or thinking. Yeah, that that's a great point. And and I'll just highlight this since you kind of touched on something and stimulated my, my mind. I just finished reading this book called Dominion, How the Christian Revolution Changed the Modern World. It's hmm. by a popular historian, Tom Holland. And he, he argues you cannot understand the modern world without understanding the enormous impact of Christianity in general and its morality in particular. And he, he, he just shows you how different the world we live in is towards the ancient world. So he even has like a chapter in there on like Black Lives Matter or the woke movement. And he said in the ancient world, a movement like this would have been inconceivable. No lives mattered in the ancient world, except if you were in a position of power, everybody else was just there to serve you. But he said, now today we say, well, black lives matter or these lives matter or the lives of the unborn matter. And the reason we say that is because of Jesus of Nazareth that he changed everything, and he did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and especially for Jesus, the lives that especially didn't matter were the ones that mattered. Amen. The outcasts, the ones yeah. on the margin. Right. Okay. Other Wait. questions or comments? Yeah. How would you describe a deist? Did you hear that? I don't know if you heard the question, Scott. Well, I think she's asking you, how would you describe it, deist? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Either one. <laughs> Go, Pastor. <laughs> you know, uh, well, you, you described it, I thought, very well. Uh, and that is the idea that, um, that God, that there is a creator, that there is a God who created everything. But as the song says, uh, he, from a distance, he remains. And that there's this whole idea that there is a God, sometimes people refer to a higher power, but, but he is not personally involved or engaged in our lives or the details of our lives. Uh, and so he, he's, he spun the world into existence and then now is watching it uh, take place, which is of course very different than the understanding uh, in scripture from the very beginning that God was intimately involved in creation because in, he was intimately involved with the creation of what he created like any artist is uh, and so much so that in dramatic fashion he entered into his own creation in order to save and redeem it uh, from itself uh, in the person of Jesus. Uh, so a deist you know, and, and there, there are many things that are attractive about the deist position, uh, especially for those in political power, like many of those who were forming our country, but also today. I think there are many deists, uh, not only in our culture, in our country, in our world, but in some churches uh, that like the idea of, well, I like the idea that there's a God out there, but I don't need him meddling in my life. <laughs> Uh, even if that meddling is out of his infinite care and love, uh, I like the idea that I'm in control of my life. And, um, and a deist, that, that would be a deist uh, view. Hi, let me call you right back. About 10 minutes. Okay. Hi. Does that, does that help, Susan? Thank you. You bet. I saw Scott's head nodding, so I think we were mostly in agreement there. Oh yeah, great, great point, thanks. Other questions? You know, Scott, you mentioned, um, you, you mentioned Paul Johnson uh, as a historian and, and also the, this book, Dominion. Are there, are there books or authors that you recommend for those who might be interested in doing further reading and study? Um, well, if, if you're willing to kind of get down into it a little bit, I'd highly recommend Paul Johnson's History of the American People. Uh, I think he just does a great job of surveying our history clear up to about 
you know, the year 2000. And he's such a good writer that he just carries you along. He, he's got the gift of narrative. Mm. So that, that comes to mind. Okay. Um, right off the top, that's, that's the first one that I could think of, okay. you know, that, okay. that I think would, would appeal to our, our friends here who are part of this Zoom session. Okay. Well, before we wrap up, let me just give one more chance if there's any uh, any other um, any other questions out there or comments. Was this helpful, yeah, or how did you find this helpful a today? A comment. I, I was, um, go ahead. Yeah, it seems to me that that um, throughout our history, we've had a compass. The Bible was the compass. And it pointed us in, let's say, a northerly direction. Denominationally, it might have been northeast, northwest, but northern, as a as a you know general statement. But we also were brought up to to look at the compass and then steer our ship with our own rudder towards that compass. And it seems to me, I, my biggest concern is we're rudderless today and without compass. And that's where society is, is, scares me. And it's not historically consistent. It's inconsistent. I, this is my, my observation. Well, I, I share many of your concerns, hear me well. Um, I think most of us were part of this Zoom group, though. Not all of us. Not all of you here are as old as I am. Um, you're, you're more like Wayne, you know, in your early 30s. But many of us here can remember back 50, 52 years ago. I always think back to 1968. I was in junior high school. And the summer of 67, the country burned down. I mean, there were just race riots all over the country. Lots and lots of people were killed in those. And then in 1968, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. The Democratic National Convention in Chicago was an utter disaster. And every week, every week, 200 young Americans were coming home in body bags from a war in Southeast Asia that was increasingly unpopular. And the country was becoming even more divided. I look at things today and I'm really, really, really concerned for a lot of different reasons, not the le le least of which is coronavirus and its impact on people, you know, in terms of health and the economy. But I would say of our culture, the direction of our country. And so one of the things, and this is me with my pastor hat on here, one of the things I've tried to commit myself to do is to and that is to be submissive to governing authorities unless it would violate my faith. And First Timothy 2, 1 and 2 talks about praying for leaders and governors and all those in authority every day. So I, I pray for the president every day. I pray for the vice president every day. I pray for the cabinet. I pray for Speaker Pelosi. I, I pray for Senator Schumer. I pray for Mr. Biden. You know, I, I just pray for all the people who are involved involved in government. I pray for Governor Polis. I live in Denver, so I pray for Mayor Hancock. You know, I want to pray for those people because people who are in positions of governing authority right now, they have really, really, really hard jobs. And they need our prayers and they need God's grace and they need wisdom. And who knows, who knows, by the grace of God, maybe revival will break out again. And millions of Americans, millions and millions across the board, White, black, yellow, brown, red, doesn't matter, all ages, both genders, will come to saving faith in Christ, and lots and lots of good things will really, really happen. So that's, that's kind of the sanguine side of my nature, but I'm going to keep praying that. Yeah. And I, oh, Irene? I just, you know, I remember all of that stuff, too. I grew, I'm a couple years older, probably, than Scott. I remember all of that stuff. I thought we would have been long past all of this by now, and we're not. And I just pray 
that God will help us go into a new direction, a, a direction where people are treated fairly and equally. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's been too long. I can't believe we're still doing this after all these years. Thank you, Scott. Oh, thank you. Well, and I think that's a kind of a perfect way to uh, wrap this up. You, um, both Irene and Scott have mentioned with prayer. And, you know, when, when nations, and it's particularly when our nation has faced challenging times, two things have happened. And this has been historical just beyond our country too. God's people have prayed and God's people have stepped up. That uh, the revivals that have taken place uh, were in large part because of the darkness that they, the Christians were seeing and the need for the gospel. And um, in some ways in the maybe 40s, 50s, when assumptions were common that everybody was Christian, the, the, the urgency may not have been there. And we, I believe we have more cause for urgency for, what, for the mission of God that we're carrying out at St. James than ever before, yeah. uh, which all begins uh, with prayer. And so I want to, I want to have us. Uh, let me, let me close our time with prayer, and uh, and then uh, I'll have some instructions after that. So let's pray together. <clears throat> Almighty God, we thank you, we thank you for a country like the United States. We thank you for the uh, a country that was formed with the notions of freedom, with the notions of of liberty, and 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 the geniuses that came together. Uh, to uh, form this country and set it on its way. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the place that you have had, especially through your people in our history. And, uh, and so, we, God, while we are facing challenges, we thank you uh, that we are in this country, enjoying things that we may easily take for granted that other nations don't have the opportunity to enjoy. And we thank you, Lord, that that includes the freedom to gather for worship, the freedom to declare your name, the freedom to follow you boldly and out loud, uh, where many people around the world are not able to do that and can lose their lives for it. So Lord, we do thank you for the freedoms that we have. And Lord, we pray for our, our nation's leaders. We pray for those who are leading at the national level, for our president, for Congress, uh, for those leading at the state level as well, uh, and county and city levels. Uh, for those, Lord, uh, in the face of this pandemic, uh, who are working to bring about um, a vaccine uh, for scientists and researchers, for those in the medical field, on the front lines. Uh, and God, we pray that through these challenges, your church will rise up, that you would stir even in each of us uh, this evening for what part we can each play and that we can play at St. James to be that bright light in the midst of where there, wherever there is darkness uh, and to lead the way. Uh, Lord, thank you for this inspiration tonight uh, through Dr. Winnig. Thank you for his heart, for his passion for you and for your church and for this country. And we pray your blessing on him as he preaches uh, at Faith Church uh, this Sunday, that you would bless and anoint that preaching as you have so many times and, and bless and strengthen that church because of it. And God, we thank you for the dear brothers and sisters here at St. James, that we are not alone. You have called us together to follow you, and that we can do that with love and grace and imagination. Uh, and as you have in these first 60 years of St. James, you would in these next uh, years continue to shine brightly through this congregation. So we give you the glory and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. God bless you all. Thank Thanks, you, Wayne. Scott. Take care. All Thanks, right. God bless you. Thank you. Want to uh, say, if, and I can include Scott's email. If you have questions uh, to follow up with that you'd like to follow up with him about, I know he's very, uh, he's more than well, glad to have you do that. And so I can uh, include his email address uh, in the in the communications uh, that go out. As, as we have in uh, recent weeks, if you'd like to hang out and, uh, and be in a small group with a, uh, a few other people for a few, a few minutes to pray, to share how you're doing,
I want to give that opportunity as well. And you don't have to, but I want to just give that opportunity. I know it's been meaningful for uh, 